Um, today we are very happy to start our third lecture of the conference, and we have Filippo Vicentini from Ecole Polytechnique, who will tell us about simulation of quantum anybody system with neural quantum states. Please go ahead. Thank you, Estelle. Thanks uh, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I will start a bit slow so you can slowly wake up from whatever you did last night in the center of Trieste. I hope you tried spritz uh, and all the beauties the city has to offer. Um, yes, so maybe before I start to wake you up a bit, I would like to tell you very briefly about how I came to be here. Uh, because it's quite funny, I, did, I never started by doing uh, really like machine learning. A few years ago in my PhD, I was actually studying quantum optics and uh, open quantum systems. And uh, only towards the end, I started to get interested into like machine learning and in particular how we could use uh, neural networks to, to empower and to, let's say, to, to solve some, to perform some simulations that we could not do otherwise. Uh, fun fact, uh, we never managed to do the simulations. So. But I, I still got my PhD, and then I wanted to go to, to the Flatiron Institute in New York. Like This funny man said, no, you can't. Um, he refused my visa. So if any one of you ever has problems with visas, like guys, it happens to everyone. It happened to me twice. Uh, and so eventually I went to Lausanne to work with uh, Giuseppe Carleo, and, uh, which was very nice. I mean, the city is not the same. But scientifically, it was a very nice day. And in that process, I started working a lot on neural quantum states and machine learning for quantum physics. Uh, and uh, we, we started over the years to try to create some bridge between the language that is used by the machine learning community and the language that is used by the quantum physics, in particular, computational quantum physics community. And I also became a strong advocate for open code, open sourcing everything we do. Because I strongly think that, uh, let's say, if you do your research, if you publish your results, and you don't share the code that is used to generate those results, at least in numerical physics, your research is not reproducible. And therefore, you're just slowing down the research as, uh, like as a global machine. Of course, you might think that this gives you a competitive advantage, because uh, other people cannot take your code and, and do similar simulations. But at the same time, if you share your code with everyone else, uh, they will start talking to you. They will ask your expertise. They will uh, discuss with you. And in the end, what happens by doing this, at least uh, what was my experience, is that you just create bigger and bigger collaborations. You meet new people. You work with more people. So really, in my experience, and since you're all young and uh, you are uh, probably starting or uh, started your PhD in the last few years, like, it's very important to always be very open about about, about this. We can be 100% reproducible in this field of research, at least uh, for purely computational physics, so let's try to be. At least that's what I would like to be. And nowadays I'm in Paris at the Ecole Polytechnique, and uh, yes, so for anyone who is uh, finishing their PhD or, I don't know, is bored of their postdocs or not bored but want, need to find a new one, we are looking for a postdoc. There's some of my people down there, uh, like if you want to know if I whip people, if I hit people or not, uh, ask them, they will tell that uh, it's absolutely not true, right? Okay, so with that, um, very briefly, what am I going to discuss, right? So at least in machine learning for quantum physics is this uh, uh, funny little community that is growing continuously, um, and there's many blobs inside of it. Uh, those, at least, are some that we identified uh, last time we met, in a sense. So you, you may have seen uh, with uh, Eliska some uh, analysis and detection for quantum data. So you collect some data, right, from a quantum computer or so fr from some experiment, and you do some analysis, you do some machine learning techniques on it to extract some more information. Um, you will see later on, I think, something about optimal control or controlling experiments or doing some reinforcement learning on some experimental device or some uh, real devices. There are several uh, uh, lines of research about using machine learning to improve uh, compilation, in a sense, of quantum algorithm. But that's not what I'm discussing today. <coughs> today we'll discuss about ab initio quantum simulation. So, which means, essentially, I have a quantum system so someone tells me there's an electron, there's another electron, there's a third electron, electrons interact through the Coulomb force, and uh, what happens? 
And so there is no data whatsoever. Everything I'm going to tell you today, no data. But you can think of, you can try to think in terms of what's the data set to try to find bridges to machine learning. But there's no data, at least not in the standard sense. I'm just trying to understand what happens, what's the structure, what's the solution of a quantum system. So pretty much I'm trying to do what people have done for a very long time. Actually, all the techniques I'm going to present today are quite old. I'm just trying to present them in some, somewhat a more modern fashion, where I'm trying to draw some bridges towards what is done in machine learning. And uh, just a few references very quickly. Well, OK, everyone knows the books about from Goodfellow and Benjo, which uh, well, it's not too bad, but it starts to be a bit outdated, maybe. Um, I really like that, uh, that, uh, that other book by Murphy on pluralistic machine learning, which contains several um, interesting tidbits about a little bit more up-to-date, I think. Today's talk, there's quite a bit of material from this uh, book or lecture notes, uh, Modern Applications of Machine Learning to Quantum Sciences which exists uh, only thanks to the sheer uh, will force of Anna, who is somewhere around here, I think. Uh, down there, don't hide. Um, which originated from some school, a bit like this one, uh, organized in uh, Warsaw a few years ago. Um, I will mention a few things about automatic differentiation later on. Uh, it's a different picture, more mathematical, but which allows you to understand it a bit better. I strongly suggest you read those notes uh, from Betancourt, Michel Betancourt, which, who is, uh, the, during his PhD, invented neural differential equations, somewhat, um, which is the geometric theory of higher order automatic differentiation. Just chapter one. And Section two and three, they deal with higher order uh, automatic differentiation, very complicated things. But section one is just three pages long. It's a very clean introduction about what it really means, like mathematically, to do automatic differentiation and what are the fundamental operations and how to reason computationally, algorithmically, um, in terms of what can be done and what cannot be done. And finally, code-wise, well, um, I'm a strong JAX advocate, so. You cannot ask me anything about PyTorch, or not much. Um, I really like Julia, but it's very hard to do the kind of things I, I do with Julia nowadays. So I really push everyone towards Jax. On Friday, there will be some, some interactive uh, tutorial using some notebooks we developed also based on Jax. We developed a code uh, in the spirit of open source and open code and sharing everything, which is called NetGet, uh, which implements pretty much most algorithms, let's say, that we worked on in the last years. And um, there will be ex some notebooks uh, in this uh, GitHub repository. Uh, I collect all the notebooks from my lectures, and uh, I will add something for, uh, for Friday. Okay? But you find a lot more material, so you can also have a look at some point about stuff that will not be discussed in the lecture. OK, so I hope now you're awake. And let me give a very brief overview of what I'm trying to solve. So I will, be, I will go very fast. I just want to settle down on some notation. Um, let's start uh, down there. I will say something super obvious now, and just to settle down on the notation so everyone agrees. Please interrupt me any time during this lecture. I will be happy to answer questions. OK, so mainly for today, I will be discussing spin systems, because they are simple. Um, so a single spin, we can say that the wave function, right, psi, is an object that lives in the Hilbert space, which I will write down like that. Essentially, it's a collection of all complex vectors uh, which are a linear combination of some basis elements. In this case, up and down. Okay? I will use this. Sorry? Okay, let's try. So, so the, I will. Label with B of H, uh, not bounded operators, but the basis of, uh, of this Hilbert space, which in this case uh, will be simply the set of up and down. Okay? So those are the two basis elements uh, that I have. 
and the dimension of the Hilbert space is essentially the number of elements in the basis, and in this case, it's simply true. Okay? This is all very simple. And in my notation, the wave function, so I could be more mathematical about it, I will be very quick and sloppy, because we don't need the details. But the wave function is simply an object that takes elements from the, from this basis, okay? Actually anything, but in particular from this basis, and gives us a complex number. Which means essentially you feed it, I don't know, some up configuration, and you get up psi equal psi of up, okay? And I know this is the dual, etc. like, let's just be very, very, very sloppy about this, fine? And, uh, and you can always use this to insert an, ide an identity, essentially, and you can always decompose the wave function, something like that, right? So the identity is nothing over than a sum over the projectors, projectors on all the basis elements, so I'll write it like that, sum of x, of x, x, Psi, where x essentially is the elements, is the basis elements. Okay? Which essentially means this is simply psi of up, up element plus psi of down, down element. Is this clear for everyone? Okay. So you see now my, my wave function, but I can write it like either like this bracket or like this really like function evaluation in a sense. I fitted one of those basis elements like up or down and it gives me an output, okay? And now mathematically, uh, I can always have this up and down correspond to some numbers like zero and one, minus one and one, okay? I can always take a representative of it. Is this clear? Yes. Good. This is, let's say, one body physics. Now, I will actually want to talk about many body physics. So I will actually take an Hilbert space that is a tensor product of many particles. And in this case, uh, essentially, I will have that a Hilbert space is given by uh, the linear combinations of the, let's say, up, 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 up plus alpha up, 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 down, etc., etc. okay? So the basis, likewise, is of this many body Hilbert space will be all spin ups, one spin down, and then on all spin down. The dimension of this Hilbert space, of course, is exponential, true to the n. And so if I want to unpack my wave function in this basis, what I get is something that looks like this. Sum over x, so let's say over x1, xn, of psi of x1, xn, x1, xn. Clear? And for the rest of the talk, I will again be a bit sloppy, and I will just write this as sum over x of psi of x, x. Where technically this is a vector, but practically I will never write it, okay? Just remember it. And this sum therefore runs over exponentially many entries. So doing this sum is expensive. Okay, now, if I take my basis, not as an unordered set, but as an ordered set, like I can say that this is the first element of my basis, this is the second element of my basis, blah, blah, this is the last one. I have a one-to-one -one correspondence between an integer, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3, 4, depends how you count, and, uh, um, and those basis elements. So in a sense, I can always store in a computer the wave function, this object, as a vector, as a vector of complex numbers, right? I can store it somehow like this, as psi of up, up, psi of up, up, down, psi of down, down, right? 
this vector will be exponentially large. So if we do 20 sides, well, if I do 20 spins, 2 to the 20, uh, it's, I don't know, if you, yes, 16 megabytes of memory. It fits in my, my laptop easily, no problem. Um, if I do 30 spins, that takes 16 gigabytes, which I think is all the memory I have in my laptop. And if I want to do 14, let's say 15 spins, think about, um, I'd written it down. Yes, so the largest supercomputer nowadays has uh, five petabytes of RAM. So, yes, so we can probably do about 50 spins by filling up all the memory of the largest supercomputer on Earth. You might go to a policymaker and tell him that you have a solution at 51 spins, so you just need to build a second supercomputer. Okay, now you have two supercomputers, you can do 51. And actually, the answer is that 52 spins, uh, well, you need two more supercomputers. And so, right, that's the quantum many body problem. We cannot store this wave function. We need to compress it down somehow to something that is manageable. Or we need to make approximations that, in a sense, truncate away the quantumness from my problem, or, the, or that leverage some of my physical understanding of the systems such that I don't have to deal with so large, such a large data set or such a large object in memory. So this is the memory complexity aspect of a quantum many body problem. However, this is not the only phase of it. I like to think of the quantum many body problem as a, as a coin with two facets, okay? One is the memory complexity and the other one is the runtime complexity or computational complexity, which means this is purely a storage problem. Imagine for a moment that I have a black box that can store a lot of data, like from any of your favorite sci-fi movies, and uh, now I, I just want to, now I can query this box, I can ask it, give me the numbers, give me the numbers, like give me this entry, give me like the hundredth entry, give me the last entry, and you can query it, but how do we compute expectation values in quantum mechanics? Expectation values are computed by taking this dot product, right? Psi psi. And this, essentially, uh, how do I write it in terms of those configurations, which is eventually what I store in my computer, where, again, this might be very obvious for most of you. This is just a sum over x, y, which arise from inserting an identity here and here. I will forget the denominator for a moment, but it's there as well. Right? So I have three sums, and if you didn't forget that I have this fancy notation for actually summing over n binary variables, well, it means that those sums are summing over exponentially many entries. So here I have two sums that run over two to the power of n entries. So even if I have a black box that can solve the memory aspect of a quantum many body problem, I still have to compute things, and computing things will take exponentially many operations. So if you use, I don't know, like if you have a big supercomputer that can do it in a reasonable time, you add another spin, you need twice the amount of time or twice the number of supercomputers, and uh, like this eventually breaks down. So you cannot solve this problem efficiently. So we don't only need to solve the memory complexity aspect, so we don't only need to find a compression, way, a way to compress the wave function, but we also need to find a way to compute quantities efficiently, okay? And uh, essentially I will be discussing those two aspects. And it's important to keep in mind this duality because there are some algorithms, like I think you will see them this afternoon, like tensor networks, that can solve and can address both problems at the same time. However, there are more general compression algorithms in a sense, like neural quantum state, which is what I will be discussing today, that only solve the memory aspect and we need another algorithm to solve the runtime complexity. Okay? Good. So, how do we solve this problem? Well, it's, uh, it's very simple. What we do is, uh, what we do is we take the wave function and 
instead of storing this very large number of <laughs> complex numbers, we do a little trick. No, I don't have colors, unfortunately, but I do have colors. Oh, oh. It's fine, it's fine. Thanks. So instead of storing this large set of numbers, I will instead now store a vector theta, let's say, where uh, theta lives in some W, which I will call my variational space, or my space of variational parameters, which it's defined such that the dimension of W is much smaller than the dimension when the exponentially large dimension of a Hilbert space, okay? And now, I simply just add a paddix theta here, everywhere, okay? So the semantics of everything don't change, but now instead of storing all those numbers, like the uh, two to the power of n complex numbers, I just store a small set of complex numbers, theta, and uh, I can just recompute those entries at every time. So I don't store all the entries, I store a compressed version of it, okay? And like in, in this sketch here, like you, re you really can think of it, you compress it down, and like evaluating the wave function for one entry is just some sort of decompression, okay? And now if this variation space is very small, if I just have a small number of parameters and not an exponentially large one, or if I have a polynomial number of parameters, well, I compress down my wave function, I can store it, and I'm happy. Is it clear? Good. I will discuss later what we can use to, to compress. So mathematically, uh, one thing I like to say is that in a sense, we have some map that goes from this W space, from my space of variational parameters, to the Hilbert space, okay? Which essentially takes one theta, which is a vector in a sense, but again, I will generally not write it as a vector, because otherwise I, I will just putting, be putting arrows everywhere, and that's boring. Um, and this associates to me, like this, this wave function, and then this mathematical object is the same as always, okay? So if you like differential geometry, you can think of it in terms of manifolds and maps, but I will not be discussing this too much, but there's a lot to it. Okay. Now, and again, even if I, even if I do this, of course, if I put small thetas everywhere here, you can see very well but I, I don't solve the runtime problem. But I still have those sums over exponentially many entries, and this, this issue is still there. Okay. So, let me, let me give you a few examples of what we can do to compress. Like, and so, like, those kind of compressions uh, in, like, the historical jargon for physicists is uh, variational. And and I think you have to put an umlaut here for the plural, but I always get confused. Germans can correct me, please. Okay, so the most simple way is to, the, the, the simplest, uh, let's say, variational ansatz I can think of, if we can call it a variational ansatz in a sense, is some sort of mean field or like, of mean field projection. So. Instead of storing the full wave function, I, I say that psi theta of x1, xn will just be some psi theta 1 of x1, psi theta 2 of x2 times psi theta n of xn, okay? So now every one of those, it's a wave function for the single particle, which is two complex numbers, and I simply take the product. So in total, I have two times n complex numbers to store, and I can always evaluate it efficiently, right? I could just query this entry, this entry, this entry, I just take the product. What happened? Of course, this cannot represent all states. If you know something about uh, quantum mechanics and entanglement, you will know that this is a product state and it cannot represent and encode any quantum correlation. It's a brutal approximation. 
turns out that if you do this, and you plug in this, this answer inside of this expression, you can also automatically compute those sums because like, they will factor out and everything will be much easier. So you actually solve both issues. But of course, it's brutal. And so we want to go a bit beyond. I want to study systems with uh, quantum correlations. So. Or product state. So what you will see this afternoon instead is uh, some sort of generalization of this approach, which is, uh, I will only write the matrix product state, or MPS for short. Which, um, which belong to a larger family of tensor networks, uh, which are essentially uh, correspond to writing your wave function as some contraction of different tensors, okay? So you can think of, as if you have several tensors, I will now use Einstein notation. So very, well, no. I have some sums over I1 to IN and I prime to I prime N, which are some indices, and I have some indices with three legs. So x1, i1, i1 prime, and this is, let's say, I, a1, so then a2, x2 is an index, and then i, no, sorry, it's only i1 to in, so i1 to i2, i2, i3, blah, 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 i n to i1, n, xn. So basically, A is a free leg tensor. So it's not a vector, not a matrix, but a free, te free tensor. Um, one, one tensor leg has dimension two, and I index it with x1, which is right either down or up. And then the other two legs can be anything as large as you want, and they kind of encode the correla quantum correlations between different sides. And if you take those legs, I1 to I2, et cetera, to have just dimension one, essentially you go back to this product state. This is very powerful. It turns out that for several theoretical reasons that are very interesting, um, this is probably the most efficient structure you can use for any problem that is one-dimensional, at least for the ground state. But in general, what do we do if we have a two-dimensional system, three-dimensional system, if we have some chemical molecule where it's very hard to define precisely a structure? Is there a question? No. So, um, so what, there, there's many other ancestors that have been developed over the years. Um, I will just cut it short and say that at some point in 2017, uh, Giuseppe Carleo and Matria Stroyer had the nice idea to say, why don't we just take, instead of something complicated that requires a lot of uh, physical knowledge about the system, why don't we just take a neural network and let's call it a day. So essentially they said, why don't we take for my wave function answers something that is like literally the exponential of the output of a neural network. Okay? And actually you can also think that this exponential, you can just leave it away and it's a technicality, okay? This is this huge science paper. Like the idea is simply to say, my variational answer is the output of a neural network, that's it. Done. Okay, but now of course there's a, lot of, there's a lot of details about it and mainly like the questions that we started asking ourselves later were what neural network should we, we, we pick? Should we use restricted Boltzmann machine, fit for one network, convolutional network, transformers, uh, graph networks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How do I encode some physical knowledge about the systems like into those neural networks? How do I make it uh, permutationally anti-symmetric if I want to do fermions? And those are a lot of details, very important and very interesting that we keep, ask, ask, keep asking us each day, kind of. And, uh, but, but the underlying idea is simply to say uh, the wave function is complicated if I don't know how to approximate it, I can just try to approximate it with a neural network. Why? 
Well, because a neural network is a universal approximation, a, a universal function approximator. So in a sense, uh, this is a sketch of a feedforward network. If you for a moment consider just a neural network with one hidden layer, I assume you know how to read these types of sketches, it turns out that if you take an infinitely wide neural network, so if you have infinitely many parameters, of course, but there's some limit where if you increase the width, you can approximate better and better an arbitrary function. That's the universal approximation theorem. So let's say if you have some f star, some function that you want to approximate, which would be my, I don't know, some target wave function I want to encode, fw is my psi of theta, if you want, the wave function that is encoded as a neural network. I can increase the width. If I find the good parameters, I can represent it. Of course, I need to find the good parameters. This would be the rest of this, uh, of this, seminar, of this lecture. Now, this is for one layer, okay? This is proven, like, already by Sibenko in 89 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and several others later on. However, this was, uh, I, as I said, this is for one layer neural network, like one hidden layer. More recently, people started to say, why is deep learning so powerful? Why, why do deep networks work so well? Well, here it's problematic. There are no hard results. There are many conjectures. At least last time I checked, maybe I'm outdated. because It was a few years ago. But I have heard no, let's say, any, any huge award being given out. So I think that's still the case. And so there's a few conjectures that say that if I, I send the depth to infinity and I keep the width of my network constant, and every time you increase the, uh, the, the depth, essentially you're just m multiplying by some number, adding some constant number of parameters. Well, then it turns out that the error that you commit in your approximation, in your best approximation, goes down exponentially fast. So you see, it, it's very interesting because for one layer neural networks, at least those are not very useful in practice, but are just um, motivational results let's say, like foundational results that tell us why this approach should work. If I have a one layer neural network, like one in the layer neural network, if I double the number of parameters, the error of my best approximation should go down like polynomially, okay? Instead, if I have a deep network, if I add another layer, which I'm not even doubling my number of parameters, well, the error is going down exponentially, so much faster. So this is not proven anywhere, but there's a lot of evidence that it is the case. There's some tentative proofs in some very edge uh, cases that are completely useless in practice, but actually interesting from a mathematical point of view, and you can read about them in that paper by Lou and co-workers from 2017, now RIPS, which is highly cited by today. It's very beautiful, if you like math, because it's a bit intense. But, but that's the idea. That's why deep learning is, in, in theory, powerful, okay? Because if you just, if, you can approximate things much better. And so, eventually we will want to do the same. Even if in the field of neural quantum states for the first three years we were just using one layer neural networks for most of our papers. And it's okay. And uh, if you're asking, your, and before I delve in the other aspects of how we compute quantities with neural network quantum states, let me just say one very quick thing. What happens if I encode my neural network this way? Well, first, assuming I, if there are no assumptions on the architecture of a neural network and if there are no assumptions on the weights, the neural network will be spitting out random numbers. Now, the beauty of Hilbert spaces is that it's just a vector space. So any set of random numbers, it's a valid vector in the Hilbert space meaning that a neural network that is encoding a wave function will always be encoding a physical wave function. Maybe it's not the one you're looking for, but it's always a valid state. It's not normalized, but it's valid, okay? The reason I mention this is because if for some reason you're a bit masochist like me and you want to study um, open quantum systems and encode density matrices, this starts to be much harder because you cannot allow for any density matrix to be encoded. You want it to be Hermitian and you want it to be positive semi-definite, maybe. Apparently not, but okay. Right? But for closed systems and Hilbert spaces, anything's good. 
So there was this, again, aspirational result by Arsherir in 2021 with Giuseppe and others that essentially proved mathematically that if we take feedforward networks, uh, uh, like very general, very, very arbitrary neural networks, we can say that they are able to encode the states of all gapped 1D Hamiltonians, which is what you can represent very well with tensor networks, with MPS actually, matrix product states. And it proved that neural quantum states under very wide assumptions can always uh, represent exactly a matrix product state. Okay? Again, I'm not talking about the details of the architecture. I will be discussing it later, but it, you can take a fit for one network with one or two layers. And they also proved that PEPs, like projected entangled pair states, which are some sort of generalization to two dimensions of matrix product states, uh, can also be, well, not represented exactly, but can be approximated with exponential accuracy by an arbitrary neural quantum state. So in a sense, we sketch, they sketch this diagram where we say like neural quantum states in principle are more general. Now again, I'm not saying that you should use neural quantum states for one dimensional systems for on anything other than benchmarking because tensor networks are extraordinary for this kind of problems. But for problems where you cannot use them, this has to be fair game. And then there were several uh, results about the fact that neural quantum states can encode some uh, string bond states, or some topological states, ground states. They can represent volume law states. Uh, and there's a lot of results about what we can represent. To this day, there are not many results about what we cannot represent, what the neural network cannot represent. And this, I think, is the next frontier understanding what are the limits of those techniques. So I will not be talking about it because we have essentially not zero, but very few results. But there's very interesting questions to be asked about what are the limits, and uh, maybe you will be working on it in a few years. So, again, for the rest of this hour, let's say, every time I write neural network, or Psi Theta, this is just an arbitrary network, okay? This could be some convolutional, some, some, some feed forward, but it's, let's keep it general for now. And uh, instead, let's discuss how we can solve the runtime complexity problem and how we can compute expectation values efficiently. So in a sense, the problem is that the Hilbert space is too large and I have some sort of a full Hilbert space. So Either there is some magical property, like for tensor networks or product states, where in a sense I'm truncating away some huge chunks of the Hilbert space, so I don't need to do this sum over everything, or I need to just ignore blobs of the Hilbert space. So what I will be trying to do will be to try to rewrite this expression in some form, where instead of summing over the full Hilbert space, I sum only on some carefully chosen configurations axis of the Hilbert space, okay? And essentially this means I will be doing some Monte Carlo sampling to select the most important configurations and evaluating the energy, some sort of energy estimator only on some configuration. So how do we do that? Well, again, I start from this expression, psi theta h psi theta divided by psi theta psi theta. Now, what I can do is I can insert an identity here, as I've done that, right? And so I get sum over x of psi theta x, x h psi theta, divided by psi theta psi theta. I've just done basically nothing. And then I can take another color and I can do now something very, I don't know, very stupid, but which is the foundation of all the calculations we do all the time, which is I multiply and divide by psi theta of x, okay? So why do I do that? Because I want to extract some probability distribution. So you see, if it is complex, if I multiply it by complex conjugate, I get a probability distribution. 
the bottom amplitude. So now if I collect them, I get something that looks like sum over x of say theta x square modulus divided by psi theta psi theta times x h psi theta divided by x psi theta, okay? Now there's a little caveat. I divided by psi theta of x. This might be zero, and the mathematical police might come looking for me. Turns out that I am allowed to, like the law says I can. Why? Because psi theta of x is already in this expression. So if psi theta of x was equal to zero, this blob would be zero, okay? In a sense, what I'm saying is that, with another color, I can say that I sum over all x's such that psi theta of x is not zero, okay? Because then I have another blob where I sum over the axis where psi theta of x is zero, where I have psi theta of x, x, h, psi theta, divided by psi theta, psi theta. Well, but psi theta of x is zero, so this is zero. So this is zero, right? And so I'm allowed to do that. Remember that because later on I will do this and I will not be allowed, okay? So I do this, and I get this expression. Now, this blob here is the Born probability amplitude, right? So it's, it's a quantity that is, so this blob here, I, I will often call it p theta of x, which is a real number. It's larger than zero, and it sums up to one. Do you all agree? Is it clear to everyone? Yes? Good. So I can also write this as expectation value of x taken from p of x, which is just the square modulus of a wave function, of x h psi theta divided by x psi theta. Okay? And uh, I will call this thing inside here, I will call it h log theta of x. This is just an historical name. This is called the local energy or local estimator. In a sense, because uh, I'm sampling a probability distribution, I get configurations access from the Hilbert space uh, depending on their probability amplitude. And then I can compute some local estimator local in the Hilbert space. It depends only on this x and the parameters theta that tells me how much this configuration contributes to the energy. Yes? Good. Now, this is an expectation value. So if I want to know what is the average age of the students in this room, I can ask every one of you, and this is correct. Or I can just sample some representatives of you, well chosen, and just take the average among them. This is not an exact calculation anymore. I will not know the exact average age among you, but I will know, I will have a good guess. And the more people I ask, the better this approximation will be, right? So why I don't do the same? Why don't I pick configurations from a probability distribution drawn according to the Born amplitude, and I just compute the local estimator for those configurations and not for all of them. And since I have an exponential problem, why don't I just take polynomially many? So a polynomial number that I can treat with, I can deal with, and not an exponentially large number. Yes? So that's what happens in practice. Essentially, I approximate this expectation value with its sample mean or its sample average, which means I choose a certain number of samples and as number of samples, I take a sum over, let's say, um, over some x's taking, taken from a set. Let's say, no, let's write it as i from 1 to an s, 
of, um, of h log theta of xi, where xi are distributed accordingly, according to this probability distribution. Okay? Is this clear? I see confused heads. Right. And now this, so the, you see, I started from a sum over exponentially many entries. I end up with a sum over a few entries. And I'm happy. Now, this all works and it's polynomial if h lock is also polynomial time. So if I can compute h lock in, in, in a short amount of time, not in an exponential time. And I don't have blackboards anymore. Um, yes. Let's take uh, this one. And if you remember here, there were two sums, right? I put two identities. I solved the first one, but I still have a second one to deal with, maybe. Um, h log of x. I need to be able to compute this in polynomial time. What is this? Well, I define it to be x h psi theta divided by x psi theta. So this is fine. This is just a query of my neural network. So I'm happy. But this one is a bit more tricky, right? Because here I can put an identity. I should put an identity and get, I get a sum over y of x, h, y of y psi theta divided by x psi theta. How many entries are in this sum? Exponentially many, right? So I didn't solve the problem. Though I did. Because it turns out that the Hamiltonian is log sparse or it's k-local, for most of the problems we're interested in. I, I will make you an example. Let's say I take as an Hamiltonian the sum of sigma x i, okay? So the sum of a transverse field on every side. What happens? Well, let's say I, I did some sampling. I got a configuration, which is like my x is up, 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 okay? Now, if I know that this matrix element is zero, I can drop it out of the sum, right? So I can restrict the sum to the y's such that uh, h, x, y is not zero, and this is fine, correct? So what are the matrix elements that are not zero? Well, it's very few of them, right? Because what does sigma x do? It simply flips one spin. So here, if I take, I ask myself, what are the y such that this object is not zero? Well, I can simply rephrase the definition of h. So I get sum over i of up, blah, blah, up of um, uh, sigma x i, y. And what is the y? such that this matrix element is not zero. Well, it's only one, correct? It's only the one where I flip the if spin. So I can write this as uh, sum over y of up, up, and here I have um, up, 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 down on the i side, up, right? Do you agree? So I call those the connected elements of a, ma of a matrix. So given an operator or a matrix H, I, I can take a configuration in, the, in the, my, the basis of my Hilbert space, so like all ups or some other thing I sample, I take, I generate whatever, I don't care. And then I ask what are the connected entries, which in a sense means like what are the configuration that H connects it to such that H is not zero. And in general, they are polynomially many, as long as your Hamiltonian is physically reasonable, which means you have some local interactions, few body interactions, like one, two, three, four body, 
you go to eight body, of course, you start to have a lot of those connected entries, okay? And so you get one of those entries in general for every Pauli operator you have in your Hamiltonian. This is very similar to what happens in quantum computing. And so, in a sense, let's say for this particular Hamiltonian, this sum here over y will simply be essentially a sum over all the y's where I flip only one side, okay? So I have only order number of spins, uh, non-zero entries in this sum. And then I simply query my wave function for those modified configurations. I recombine them accordingly, and I'm done. Is it clear? So in a sense, uh, computationally speaking, if I want to build some code or some algorithm, you will see it on Friday, that, uh, that, that computes this, what I need is simply a black box, a function, an object, to which you feed the, the configurations of your Hilbert space and you ask, what are the connected components? What are the components such that the Hamiltonian, the matrix element is not zero, and also what are those matrix elements? Because you have to put them here, okay? So if you play with netcat, you will see that we exactly have one such function, which is called get connected elements, get con, which gives you those objects. And it's a very good building block to implement this kind of algorithms. And it's something you should do yourself if you're writing those algorithms, algorithms from scratch for yourself. Okay? Are there any questions? Good. So, in a sense, until now, I, prove, I told you that we can compress the wave function down to something small by using some variational representation. But uh, those variational representation, if I have a polynomial number of parameters, they are efficient in a sense. I've also assumed, I didn't say it, but I assumed that when we evaluate those bit strings, those configurations, when we evaluate my neural network, the evaluation of the network is efficient. As in, it's polynomial time, it's not exponential time. Of course, because if I took an exponential amount of time just to evaluate one configuration, I, I would not be discussing it, okay? But this is also part of the efficiency. Now I said that to compute expectation values, or any bracket, essentially, I can always take those expressions and rewrite them in terms of ex classical expectation values over some probability distribution, in this case, the Born probability amplitude, of some local estimator. And the local estimator, in turn, is efficient to be computed, because my Hamiltonian is physical, because it only has few body operators. Yes? Yes. Yes. What is the expectation value of this expectation value? What is the expectation value of the imaginary part? Yes. Exactly. So, so since you already know the answer, you can just truncate it. And it can actually be used to know how off your algorithm is, how off your sampling is. Because if you see a huge imaginary part, well, it's a warning bell that something is off. You don't know what, but something is off. So it's actually handy to check it. But indeed, you know it's zero, so you, can just, you, you usually just truncate it. Any more questions? No? Okay. So one thing I didn't discuss yet is how can we generate those samples, right? So by the way, those samples are very easy to generate in a sense on a quantum computer because if instead of a neural network here I had the variational quantum circuit or some quantum circuit, those are just the bit strings I can get out of it. However, how can I generate them starting from a neural network? So if my, if my model is generative, right, I can just sample from it. If my model has a tractable marginal, I can just generate configurations from its probability distribution. But in general, my model is not generative. In general, the marginal is not tractable. In general, I do not know how to generate probability samples distributed according to this. Why? Because it's not normalized. Right? Because my neural network here is completely general, it's not normalized to one. So if I draw a configuration, it might be 10,000 or 100,000, I don't know. The reason why he, this is an expectation value is because I divided by psi theta, psi theta, by, the, by essentially its normalization factor. 
by computing this normalization factor involves the sum of the full Hilbert space over all the basis elements, which is exponentially large, and I cannot do that, okay? So one thing I would like you to remember, if you just wake up for 10 seconds and you can go back to sleep, is that every time you have those objects, the way we construct the sampling estimators is always by looking at what we cannot compute and we make it disappear by shoving it inside of the, pr of the probability distribution, okay? This psi theta, psi theta, the denominator, I do not know how to evaluate it. I do not know how to estimate it. So I simply try to construct a probability distribution for which this is the normalization, okay? Because then when I write it as an expectation value, the probability distribution, actually all the probability, the probability with its normalization disappears. Is this clear or was it too fast? So it's a guiding principle. If you ever want to write a stochastic estimator for some crazy quantity, ask yourself the question, what can I not compute because it's too hard and make it disappear with a sampling? Okay? Good. Can go back to sleep now. Okay. So now I want to quickly say something about how we generate samples drawn from a distribution, assuming my neural network is completely arbitrary or not generative for those that like machine learning language. How do we do that? Um, we do Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling with the Metropolis Hastings acceptance rule. So if you know what this is already, raise your hands. Do I need to show it? Yes, okay. <laughs> then I will quickly show it. The others can, I don't know, go back to your Twitter feed or anything for five minutes. Um, let me get my notes. Yes, so question is, how can I generate a number of samples that are drawn from a probability distribution P of X, okay? And I want to generate some set of samples, x0, x1, xn. I'm sorry for Julia people that I start counting from zero, really, I, I feel you. Um, I should stop at n minus one, so I'm really doing a mess. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we can start from what is known as the um, notes, notes, detail balance condition, sorry. So this is the starting point from which we, der we can derive our algorithm. And the idea is the following. If those configuration respect the detail balance condition, then I know that, um, so if those configurations are distributed according to this probability distribution, they should respect the detail balance condition. The detail balance condition tells you in a sense that if you have a set of samples and you change them, the way you change them does not change the overall probability distribution, okay? So it's some sort of, if I have some non-equilibrium system at equilibrium, meaning if I, like, if I have some macroscopic equilibrium but not microscopic because there are still some changes at the microscopic level, I need to respect this condition. And the condition tells you essentially that the probability to be in the configuration X of T times, what do I do? Yes, T times the probability to go that the configuration X of T becomes X of T plus one at the next step should be equal to the probability to have a configuration X T plus one times the probability to get xt given xt plus one. Essentially it's telling you the probability that I take one random configuration from my distribution and I change it to the next should be equal to the probability to have this next configuration and to go back. Some sort of reversal symmetry, okay? And this is very, like this is a foundational result in statistical physics. So it's very beautiful, there's a lot to say about it. So I can start to play a bit with the math and I can write this thing. I can say, um, yes, I can say, well, then it means that the probability to take the ratio of the probability of a transition
So the ratio of the probability of the transition sh should, should respect this condition, right? I just divided and multiplied. And now what I want to think about is I want to find a way to construct this chain of configurations. So it means if I have one configuration at time t, I want to be able to generate the one at t plus one. How do I do that? I kind of know this probability distribution, kind of, the ratio at least. I don't know this t object. So I try to make a guess for the t object. And so I will split, I will completely say my t of x t plus one given x of t can be factored into two components, which are, in a sense, the probability to propose some configuration x prime uh, given xt times the probability to accept x prime, the, but no, sorry, let's call it xt plus one, xt plus one, given xt, okay? So I'm saying I split this ob mathematical object into two. One will be the probability to propose a new configuration and the other is the probability to accept it. Because in a sense, my algorithm will be something that looks like I have a configuration, I propose a new one, and maybe I accept it and then I, this is my next configuration or I reject it and so I just keep the old one and I go on building my chain. So now if I plug these definitions inside of here, what I get is that um, essentially I, I substitute this blob in here, I will get something that looks like this. The probability to accept x t plus, t plus one in x t over the probability to accept x t, x t plus one will be equal to t of one, t of x t times t of x t plus one, even x t divided by g of x t, even x t plus one. So it's simply math. I just shuffled around them. Now I ask myself, so if G is something random, so let's say I have a configuration, my proposal rule G is simply to pick one spin at random and flip it, okay? So my proposal rule is in a sense that given one configuration XT, I randomly pick one spin and I flip it, okay? So with probability one over N, I flip the first one, with probability one over N, I flip the second one, with probability one over N, I flip the third one. Is it clear? So this is defined, I define G, this also define the G reverse, which essentially is the same, right? The probability is always one over N, so this term in general cancels out, at least for those symmetric rules. I need to find what should be A. What is the probability to accept it? But if I want to choose a value, if, like some form of A, I need to still respect this detailed balance condition. So in a sense, I need to choose a form, a mathematical form for A, that still respects this ratio. What can I do? Well. Hastings proposed a very long time ago one expression for it. It's not the only one, there are many others, but this is the one that is used the most and has a lot of, let's say later on there was a lot of mathematical motivation why you should use it, but it's not the only one. And it is to say that the probability to accept the configuration T plus one, given your current configuration T, is the minimum between one and this blob here. So P of xt plus one divided by P of xt times this ratio, which usually is just one if your transition is symmetric. Okay, why does this satisfy the condition? Well, simply because if, let's say that this thing is lower than one, right? So it means that this thing is equal to this side so they simplify, so I have one over A reversed equal one, but now if this, is large, if this is smaller than one, it's inverse, it's larger than one, so the denominator is one. Okay, 
So I'm going a bit fast because I want to cover other things, but if you want, ask me over time. It's, if you think a bit about it, it, it comes to mind. It's really, it's, it's just the game. And then if you use this acceptance probability, essentially you respect detail balance. And so you kind of have an algorithm. Step one, you have a configuration, a completely random one. Step two, you use this G that you decide to propose a new configuration. The simplest thing, you just flip a random spin. Step three, well, this ratio is one, so you just compute the, probabil the probability amplitude for this new configuration and for the old one. And you compare whether this ratio is larger or smaller than one, and you accept it with this probability. So if it's larger than one, you always accept it, meaning if you go to a configuration that has more probability, you always accept it. If you go to a configuration that has a lower probability, you might accept it or not with exponential smoothing, okay? And now what is interesting is that if you do this many times, you build a chain of configurations that are distributed according to your uh, distribution. Of course, uh, wow, it's a strong Italian accent. Uh, of course, uh, um, there, there are many, many details about this. So this is in theory. In practice, uh, you must endure a huge amount of pain to make this work because like if, Let's say I have a configuration of spins, right? I, I flip a random one and I accept this, config this new configuration. So now I have like x1 and x2 will be two, sp two configurations that differ just by one spin flip. Are they correlated? Yes. They're not independent samples, right? The correlation time in this Markov chain will be quite large. So you need to decorrelate them. So usually you don't need to just do one flip. You need to do a lot, okay? So you need to apply this algorithm many times to generate two samples that are not really decorrelated, but they look like as if they are decorrelated, okay? So this is called sweeping, or, and so the number of sweeps you do, like the, the sweep, a sweep of the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm usually includes running this algorithm many times, taking many steps. And so in practice, you will generate a, a series of configuration, let's say x0, so let's say, uh, let's say that I'm sampling, I don't know, this is the configuration that I'm sampling. This is this sort of mark of time. And I sample my chain, right? Those are all configurations in a sense. I would not be using for my Monte Carlo estimates all of those configurations because they're correlated. So I will pick, I don't know, the first one. No, usually we discard the first part because we initialize the Markov chains from some uh, completely random configuration that is probably not good, uh, not distributed according to the distribution. So we discard the first part, uh, and then we take, I don't know, this first entry, and then this, and then this, at constant intervals, okay? So we subsample the distribution. Is it clear? So this is to increase the decorrelation, to de decorrelate the samples. And, uh, Another very important thing to remind is that depending on your Hilbert space, it's very important, or if you have some constraints, say you want to perform your calculations in some manifold that well-defined magnetization, so you want that oh, for every spin up there is a spin down, you need to make sure that your transition proposal respects this condition. So if you want that your calculation is performed in the constant magnetization manifold, so where the spins up and spin down are in equal number, you always want to propose a new configuration that still respects this condition. Or, I don't know, if you want your particles to be in a box, you must always propose configurations that are inside of this box. Otherwise, this might break down. Yes? Now, why does this work? Because here, I take a ratio of probabilities. Ratios means that the normalization factor cancels out. The normalization factor that I do not know how to compute. Yes? This is a secret ingredient in this. Because I take a ratio of probabilities here, I do not need in absolute terms what is the value of the probability for this particular configuration. I just need to know in relative terms which one is more likely. Okay? This is what saves me. Yes. Finally, questions. No, no, I'm talking about everything else. Next, next thing, optimization of theta. Okay. I'm saying you have theta, you want to compute the energy. Sorry?
I, in a second, I will get there. But the idea is that this is the energy, right? So I can either scan the full space of parameters, make a very nice like geographic, uh, geographic card uh, of a potential landscape and find the minima. This is very inefficient if I have millions of parameters. What I will do, I will take the energy, I will compute the gradient, and I will follow the gradient downwards. And that's, again, a connection with machine learning, right? Like, these people minimizing the energy in physics call it the variational principle, or the energy minimization of ground state variational principle. People in machine learning call it gradient descent, right? Minimizing a loss function, the energy is your loss function. Are there any questions about Monte Carlo sampling? And at every step, I will do this for a different value of theta. If not, the last thing, uh, we have a break at 10.30, right? Yes, okay, so the last thing before the coffee, but I hope you're awake by now, is to answer this question, like, a bit better. So until now, you have, let's say, a way that if someone tells you, trust me, those weights correspond to the state you're looking for, like those weights correspond to the ground state or to the first excited state or to the state at time t, you have a way to compute expectation values and properties of the system. You don't know yet how to, comp how to find those states. Okay, so, fuck, sorry. Okay, so, let's compute the gradient of the energy. I think I have a slide so I can go faster for this. Um, ba, ba, ba. Yes. Okay, very quickly. The variational principle, right? Please raise your hand if, it's, uh, if you have doubts about it and you don't believe me. But essentially, we want. Now I will just discuss one particular algorithm: how to find the ground state. Like, see it as okay. I'm showing you this particular algorithm, but try to grasp the bigger picture. Like, this is how we derive the algorithm in this case. You can always use the same ideas to derive pretty much other algorithms, but find other states that we're interested in. Variational principle in physics terms, uh, like if uh, like the energy as a function of the parameters W or theta, whatever, is always larger than the ground state energy. I think this should not surprise anyone. If it does, raise your hand, please. No, great. So in a sense, I can if I am a machine learning person, I don't call it energy. You can just tell to your machine learning friend, uh, like this is the loss function. The energy is the loss function. I minimize it, right? How do we minimize it? We need the gradient. So conceptually what happens is that I will initialize my neural network with some random parameter, theta. If I look at how my state overlaps with all the excited states of my Hamiltonian, essentially I will have some sort of like concept of completely random overlap with a different eigenstate. I'm very high up on the energy spectrum. Then I, I compute the gradient, which I will tell you how in a second. I follow this down. I start to uh, increase my overlap with the ground set and diminish it with the high, high energy ones. And eventually, if everything goes well, which, beware, doesn't always happen, I convert to the ground state or something that really looks a lot like the ground state. Of course, most of the time, my neural network is not so powerful that it can represent the ground state, but it can represent something that is very close to it. And because of the variational principle, I kind of know that the lower the energy, the closer I'm getting to the, to the target state, to the ground state. Yes, yes? Amazing. Okay, and please don't ask me what happens if you're on the other side of this well and you get stuck in the local minima. But machine learning people will tell you that uh, in general, if you have a very high dimensional function, right, not one dimensional, but if you have a lot of parameters, the probability to have a local minima goes down, how? Anyone? Heard something? Exponentially. 
So because if you want, if every direction of the gradient, if the gradient is kind of a random variable, to have a local minima, you need to have that all the partial derivatives are zero at the same time, and the, this is exponentially unlikely. So in general, it, when you have a very high dimensional functions to minimize, you will never have local minima, or you will, it will be more, very unlikely to have local minima. You will have uh, saddle points, which are equally as bad, but just ep maybe epsilon better. Okay, so you will have this on one direction, but uh, the other directions will be like flat or will go sli slightly down. And there's a whole set of problems about it, but in general, local minima is not a problem. Saddle points, big problem. Okay, how do we compute the ground state? Well, how do we compute the gradient, sorry. Right, this is what they want. And actually, let me write the gradient as d theta, okay? So I will use this as a, sim I will actually use in my notation, I will call this d theta, and I will use d theta i as d i as gradient of theta i, okay? Just notation. So this is actually d theta, so this is kind of a vector, right? And those are partial derivatives, but I will never put the vector signs. Okay, now, if you remember, I said before that psi is a function that takes whatever input, right? So let's say, the psi I want now to differentiate to is as also another input that I didn't discuss before, right? It's, it takes a set of parameters times a configuration in the basis of a Hilbert space and it gives me a complex number. In a sense, it takes a theta times some configuration x, right? And gives me psi theta of x, correct? Now, this is a complex function there is a little detail to be discussed about what happens when I take the derivative of the complex functions because this is not so straightforward. So one, there are two cases that matter, okay? And this is very badly written everywhere. So pay attention for a second. So we can assume that the weights are real, so that this is some r, okay? Then I might have to take the derivative with respect to theta of psi theta of x. So this is complex, but thetas are real, okay? Psi theta is not a holomorphic function because the weights are real. So basically it's a real to complex function. However, this is always well defined. If you want to understand it uh, a bit better, there's a, uh, there's a treaty about like the fact that People are obsessed with holomorphicity, but this is not actually what is the important thing. What we should care about is more like what he calls RC calculus, and it's discussed in RC calculus by Delgado on the archive. It's a very long thing, but read very easily. Just read the first chapter, which is about single variate calculus. The rest is all the same, just for multivariate. In a sense, what he wants to tell you is that this object is always well-defined, and uh, and we have this identity, right? Because d theta is real, because theta is real, right? I can write this as d over d theta. d theta is real, so I can always bring it inside of this complex conjugation. Is this clear to everyone? So this is one way I can do this calculation, assuming real parameters. The other way I can do the calculation is that I can assume that my parameters theta are complex, okay? Now, my wave function, like now the gradient is no longer well defined because I have a gradient with respect to theta and the gradient with respect to theta star. And this is related to holomorphicity on all those issues. So every time I make the calculation assuming that theta is complex, I will actually assume that also that psi is holomorphic 
with respect to theta. What does holomorphic mean? It means it respects the Cauchy-Riemann um, conditions, which everyone likes to write in this very complicated form. I like a very sim much simpler form, which is d theta star of psi theta of x, which means d in the theta star of psi theta of x is zero. Holomorphicity means that. If you don't believe me, just think about it for a moment or come ask me. Essentially, it means that your wave function or neural network does not depend on theta star. So if you don't use theta star in your network, your network is holomorphic. Cases that use theta star, every time you take a real part, an imaginary part, or modulus square, okay? So if you don't use modulus square, if you don't use the real part and imaginary part, your network is holomorphic. And you can do your, the calculation like that. If your wave function is not holomorphic, everything is more complicated. But you can just imagine that you split your parameters into real and imaginary part, and they're all real. So you have n complex parameters. You split them in twice n real parameters, yes? Essentially, there are only two ways to do this calculation that matter. One is assuming real parameters. One is assuming complex holomorphic wave function, okay? Yes? I would do the calculation with this approach because it's super simpler. You can also do it by yourself with this. You will find essentially the same formula plus a real part, yes? In most books, you will find this formula. However, I will use this one. Good. With that said, I have this, right? So now what happens when I, when I assume holomorphicity? Well, d theta star of psi of x is actually d theta star of psi of x, which is 0, correct? Which also means that the, no, yeah, this is enough, OK? Is it clear for everyone? Yes. Second thing, if I have complex parameters and I want to minimize the loss function, I need to minimize, I need to follow not the gradient, but the conjugate gradient. Is this clear for everyone? Or do you want to know why? No, that's the point. So, let's say I have E is a real function, okay? It goes from complex to real. So E of theta plus delta theta minus E of theta is a real number, right? And this is how, this is how my energy changes if I, fall, if I update my parameters according to delta theta. If I expand this to first order, I get E of theta plus delta theta times the theta of E theta plus delta theta star times the theta star E theta plus order of E square, sorry, delta theta square minus E theta. And let's take an answer. Do you agree? The reason is that E is a real output function, so it's not holomorphic, so I need to take both derivatives. So E of theta cancels out, and now E is a real function, right? So D in D theta of E theta and is equal to D of E theta in D theta star star because e theta is real. So I can rewrite this as modulus twice the real part of d theta times d theta e theta. And now I, modulus, right? And I can ask myself, what is the direction d theta where, the, where this function changes the most? So when do I, when, when do I, satur when this value is the largest, for which d theta of unit modulus? So now I can always assume that this is smaller than twice the modulus of d theta times 
the modulus of the derivative respect x with theta, right? And now, which delta theta saturates this inequality? Well, the one for which this real, uh, the imaginary part of this argument is zero. So this is saturated when delta theta is equal to d theta star of d theta. Yes? So this proves that if you want to minimize a real valued function of complex parameters, you want to follow the conjugate gradient and not the gradient. Okay? You don't need two gradients because the tangent space of the object you want to minimize is still two dimensional. You have two free, two free variables because you have a real output. You just need two numbers to, expect, uh, to express which direction to follow. This is what Delgado discusses in this RC calculus. The fact that you don't care about holomorphicity when you have a real valued loss function, but you just care about the equivalent of RC analyticity. So the fact that you can still well define a gradient with two components. And this is still encoded as a complex number. But it, it's a good point. It's really not, not, not clear. OK, so if you believe this calculation, essentially it tells you if I have complex parameters, I want to follow the, complex gra the conjugate gradient of the energy. I want to compute this gradient. Now, I can apply the chain rule. I can do d theta star of psi theta, let's say, times h psi theta divided by psi theta psi theta plus psi theta h d theta star psi theta divided by psi theta psi theta minus e of theta d theta star of psi theta psi theta divided by psi theta psi theta. Okay? Yes? Now you remember, that's why I wrote this condition. So d theta star of psi theta is zero. Okay? That's because the function is holomorphic. So this term here is equal to zero. Because it, in a sense, I'm thinking of theta and theta star as independent variables, if you want. This is psi theta, depends on your psi theta. This is, the this is the conjugate, so it actually depends on, your, on theta star, and so the derivative with respect to theta star is not zero. And so what I get is uh, d theta psi theta h psi theta divided by psi theta psi theta. Here I lose the star because I bring it inside the cat, which is conjugate. This is zero minus e of theta, and here I pull off the same trick, so the theta psi theta, psi theta divided by psi theta. Yes, yes? Okay. If you did it uh, not assuming holomorphicity and with real parameters, you would kind of get the same thing and the real part. Sorry? No, I, I absorb it back into e theta because I get numerator divided by denominator squared. So this is the energy again. So now I have brackets again, right? Those brackets, are if I plug the identity inside, they are expectation values, and so we have a sums over the full Hilbert space. They are very hard and very expensive to compute. I don't want to compute them. That way, I want to estimate them with Monte Carlo sampling, okay? So I need to pull off the same tricks I did down there obtain some probability distribution on which to expect and rewrite them as expectation values over the Born probability amplitude, okay? So this is what I will quickly do now before we can take a break. I think we're not over time, right? Yeah, come on, at least one minute. Okay. So I have two terms to compute. Let me do the second one, which is easier first. d theta psi theta psi theta divided by psi theta psi theta. Okay? If you remember, I said this denominator here object, I don't know how to compute it. So it's what I want to make disappear, right? By absorbing into a probability distribution. So what I will do is I insert an identity here. So I get d theta 
psi theta of x, x psi theta divided by psi theta, psi theta. And I pull off the same trick with the same color. I multiply and divide by psi theta x, psi theta x. So this is now a probability distribution. And I get sum over x of p theta of x times the theta psi theta x psi theta x. Clear? And now this is just an expectation value of x sample from the Born amplitude of this object, which if you want is just d theta star of log psi theta of x. Do you agree with me? Is it clear? Because this is the psi theta divided by psi theta, so it's the log. Yes? Good. So I, to estimate this object, I just sample a bit and I compute the, the gradient at those entries. Okay? Not everywhere, but just as those entries. And this is correct. This I'm allowed, right? Because if, like, I can divide by x because here there is psi theta of x. Okay. And now, last thing before lunch, before break, the theta psi theta h psi theta divided by psi theta psi theta. Again, let me put an identity here. Uh -huh. Okay, I will write it that way. And now I will pull off the same trick again. However, here, this is what I want to make disappear. There is no psi theta to square again, so I will do something horrible, and I will simply multiply by psi theta of x square, and I will divide here by psi theta of x, and here by x psi theta. Okay? Please remark that I'm not allowed to do that. So police should, like, now lock me up. Yet we do it all the time. It's wrong, and it does cause issues. Okay? In particular, it's wrong whenever the wave function has some nodes, but the derivative is not zero. We are aware of it, kind of. Okay? But we accept it. You could have put the identity on this side, then you would have a psi theta of x, eh? then you could have pulled off this trick. We discussed it in a recent paper. It's, uh, yes, it's true, you, you are allowed, but it doesn't work as well, for reasons I will discuss later, okay? So this is what we do, even if it's slightly wrong. And again, now we get, right, this is a probability distribution, so it's the expectation value of x over this probability distribution of the theta star log psi theta of x, and this is my h log of x, okay? So if I put together those two blobs, I get that the gradient with respect to theta star of the energy is the expectation value of x from this distribution, from the Born amplitude, of d theta star log psi theta of x times h log of x minus the expectation value of h log of x over x. I went a bit fast because I'm out of time, but so please bear with me. The idea is that here I have this d theta star log psi theta, which is the same object I have here. So this h log is this one, and that one was multiplying the energy, right? But the energy is nothing else than the expectation value of h log. So here I have h log minus expectation value of h log. Right? Does it make sense? No? Why? Someone? No? Okay. So now this looks a lot like a covariance, right? So in a sense, if you want, I have a times b minus b. Right? 
you can show very easily that this is also equal to A minus expectation of A times B minus expectation of B. If you don't believe me, you can just do this quick calculation. And essentially, this we usually call a covariance of A and B, okay? So I can always say that the gradient, or better yet, the conjugate gradient is actually the covariance sampled from the probab Born probability amplitude of d theta star log psi theta of x and h log of x, okay? And the fact that this is a covariance, it's a very beautiful property because it makes it such that it's very resistant to sampling noise and, uh, and it has a very low, let's say, variance, this estimator. And it is why if you had put the identity here and uh, you got a different expression for this quantity where you could divide and multiply by psi theta of x, you would not get in the end a covariance and so you would get another estimator that while correct, so unbiased, um, it has very bad noise properties. So to conclude, the last thing I want to say, this gradient, which is the gradient we estimate, is beautiful. And if you show it to a computer scientist, he will hopefully be very happy for one particular reason. In machine learning, when you take a data set, you start to do your gradient descent and you get to the bottom. You know very well that if you don't stop training at some point, you start overfitting your data and then you go like, you get some very bad results. Instead here, if I converge to the ground state, H lock of X doesn't depend on X anymore. That's because X H psi divided by X psi, I saw you Estella, <laughs> sorry. It's this, if I'm on a ground state, right? If I'm on any eigenstate, this is a constant. So H lock is equal to the energy of my state, so this object is zero and my gradient becomes zero. So if I hit any eigenstate, this gradient becomes zero and I stop optimizing and I sit on the solution. Thing that doesn't happen in machine learning. This is a very beautiful property. It comes from the fact that we don't really have a data set. We resample our data in a sense, which are our samples every step from the distribution. And so once we converge, our, our gradient becomes zero and we stop. This also has other implications, which is that the variance and the noise of this becomes smaller and smaller as we converge. And um, yeah, it becomes smaller. And so actually we, we, we have nice properties, I will say later. So let's have a break, sorry.